Welcome to CLCC. We pray that this message draws you towards Jesus and strengthens your walk with him. We believe that we were meant to do life in community. If you live in the Fraser Valley area, we would love to get you connected into the family. Find everything you need at clcc.ca. Enjoy. Good day, online family. I'm so glad that you're here with us, diving into our series, You Are Called. We've been looking at the book of Nehemiah and the journey of, of him leading his God's people in this construction project. And we've come to this really pivotal part in the story where the walls have been completed. Why don't we dive right into it in Nehemiah chapter 6. So Nehemiah 6, 15 starts this way. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. Wow. When all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. And so let's recap the story so far. We have been examining the life of the call. Did you know that you're called? Nehemiah was called. We talked about that in chapters one and two, and we learned about his journey from cupbearer to project manager, and he goes from luxury to challenge. And then in chapter three, he begins the work. He's evaluating, he's looking around, he's assigning duties. Then in chapters four through six, we learned and discovered how Nehemiah navigated opposition, external opposition and internal injustices that were going on. Nehemiah is quite the dude. And now we get to the point in chapter 615 uh, where the wall is finished. Everything that he's been working on has been completed. And then the author of Nehemiah takes note of something once the walls are up. We read it in chapter seven, verse four. So the, so the walls are finished. And then this is what Nehemiah notes. Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. And in this, in Nehemiah, we have this invitation. And the invitation is this, the wall is finished. It's time to come home. And I think that within the landscape of living as called people, it's helpful that at this hinge point in Nehemiah that we remind ourselves of Nehemiah's role in the story and, and what it means to come home in a sense. We want to zoom out and we want to see Nehemiah as a slice of the larger biblical story. And I think we can fall into the trap of looking at Nehemiah strictly from the perspective of, oh, these are all the things that we need to do to try and live up to a called life. We've been inviting us and challenging ourselves into being courageous, living with integrity, having wisdom, enduring challenges. I think we would do well to remind ourselves. And I think that at this point, this is a really good reminder. Now that the walls are finished, it's time to come home, that we are called by someone before we are called to something. It's easy to get into our heads that the doing comes first, because this is how it works for most things. If I want a good job, if you want a good job, there are lots of things we have to do in order to qualify ourselves for it. I did five years of rebar and almost the opposite was true, right? The only qualifications to do rebar were a pulse and the ability to punch in for five days a week. And that kind of set me apart from a lot of my peers. It doesn't hurt that I also married into it, so nepotism may have, may, may have played a small role. That's not really the kind of job I'm talking about. You know, the kind of careers where you get to be creative, you get to be your own boss, you get the financial security and flexibility with your time that you really want. Those are the kind of jobs that might require higher education, diverse experiences, skill acquisition, proper connections. Those are all required before you even get the call. Before you can even dream of this job, you have to do all of these things to get it. But that's not really how the kingdom of God works. 
While we certainly want to emulate Nehemiah, and I recommend that you do so, and even more so, we're encouraged to imitate Christ. But don't lose sight of this. We were chosen before we did anything. This is the story of Abraham. He's called out. He's called out out of obscurity. And God says, hey, I'm going to turn you into a nation. It wasn't anything Abraham did. He was called by God and God set him apart. What was it that the enemies of God were concerned about? That Nehemiah was really skilled? That the people of God were, uh, were uh, efficient builders? No, they were, they, were, they were worried about the God who was helping them. They were called by God. You and I are called by Jesus. And so at this juncture in the story, chapter six and seven, we're gonna resist asking what we are called to do, but rather we're gonna take a moment to discover who we are called by. Because I see Jesus all over the story of Nehemiah. I see his love and grace propelling us. And my hope in life, for you and for me, isn't that people look at us and see all the things that we did. The best thing that I can hope for in my life is that when people look at me, they see Jesus all over me. That I'm marked by his love and mercy and goodness. Something that's really transformative and life-changing. That's the kind of life that I want. And when we look at the book of Nehemiah looking for Jesus, it asks us to examine it a little differently. See, this isn't simply the story of a cupbearer taking on a construction project. This becomes, and it is, the story of God hearing our cries and rebuilding his people through Jesus. Nehemiah is just a taste. Jesus is creating a kingdom for all of us to be truly human and alive again. So as, we, as you look through chapter six and seven along our, our journey, and if you've been keeping track, maybe you're reading it with your life group, maybe you're reading it with your family. These two chapters are gonna broadly detail the complexity completion of Nehemiah's project. The wall's finished. Nehemiah appoints some people to oversee it. And then he takes a roll call of all the returned exiles. But if we were to zoom out and see Jesus in this story and see who we are called by, we discover that Jesus is a better Nehemiah. He isn't simply a cupbearer to the king. We are being called by the king of kings. So there's this fascinating invitation for us. This homecoming, uh, Nehemiah, it was like, hey, the walls are finished. It's time to come home. We zoom out in the broader biblical story and we see God's work of redemption being accomplished on the cross. Jesus died for our sins and resurrected. And it's the same invitation. It's time to come home. It is time for you and for me to come home and we need to recognize that we have been called by God. And when we look at this story in that light, that this homecoming is is being called by someone before we're being called to do something, my mind goes to this really famous story of Jesus, the prodigal son. Maybe you know it. It starts this way. You know, a man, there was a man who had two sons. Now you don't have to do anything to be a son. You are a son by virtue of being born It's just who you are. You are a son. We are called by Jesus, not by virtue of what we've done for him, but he created us. He is Lord and ruler. He's sovereign creator over all things. We are his. So there's a man who had two sons and we're we're gonna strip this human struggle. Jesus is awesome. He's brilliant. He reduces the human struggle into this awesome, brilliant story. The younger son says to his father, you know, dad, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. And uh, maybe we know the story. He, uh, he, he goes through a bit of a mess. There's a bit of a gut check here in this homecoming, this invitation, maybe you've realized this in your own life. We have been called by Jesus, but sometimes coming home isn't easy. Maybe if you're a parent, you know this in, in, in amusing terms. Maybe you've sat in your driveway for a couple of minutes. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I remember, uh, not I remember, 
Uh, right now we have a, our youngest son is two and a half and he is our tiny tyrant right now. And sometimes his proclivity towards violence makes me reconsider how I come home some days. Uh, in fact, uh, for my other two kids, and maybe I'm not going to make uh, some, some fans here, but when my kids like, are like touching a burner or, you know, pulling each other's hair, I'd often, you know, give them a smack on the hand saying, hey, hey, don't do that. Hey, this is going to be hot. Be careful. And for my older two kids, that would shock them and scare them out of anything that they were doing. And it was a very effective tool, you know, for that. And so last week, my son is grabbing my daughter by the hair, pulling her hair, hitting her. And so I, I, I take Dennis by the right hand. I say, hey, Dennis, you, you know, don't do that. We, we're not going to hit our kids. And I, I get the irony in what I'm doing there. My son is far from phased. In fact, without even flinching, his right hand being hit, he immediately balls up his left hand and hits me right in the junk. Just a southpaw swing. Ouch. Ouch. Coming home isn't always easy. And this hits us all when it comes to the life of faith. This is the reality. It's usually going to be easier to just not do it. It's usually easier to uh, continue to live as you are living, coming home, coming home to the life of faith, following Jesus, it's not easy. Nehemiah's life would have been easier as a cupbearer, right? He cut, in fact, he cut a lot out of his life so he could get that gig. It would have been way easier to ignore this whole uh, Jerusalem rebuilding thing. The temptation for you and me is to believe that our lives would be easier and more fulfilling if we can do whatever we want, and that temptation is so great, it's, it's an illusion, but it's one we've been believing for a long time. Israel throughout its history, even leading up to this point, you want to know how Israel got here, how they're exiled and how they're scattered, throughout its history would lust over the success of other nations. They begin uh, marrying into their families and eventually worshiping their gods. Maybe they even get a taste of the good life And then why would they go back to the stricter commitment to the covenant life with Yahweh? In fact, there are clues in Nehemiah 6 and 7 that would highlight that even though you'd think this rebuilding project would have been a real boon for every Jew, there are many who resisted this homecoming. Nehemiah 6 details uh, this plot, this conspiracy against Nehemiah. And not only are our regular enemies, our regular antagonists, Tobiah and Symbolet, involved, Nehemiah records that, hey, the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets wanted to make me afraid. They were God's own people who were in on the conspiracy against Nehemiah. We also discover that Tobiah, the bad guy, had intermarried within some of the nobles of the Jewish exiles and and had a bunch of them in his pocket. It seems like the well-to-do weren't jacked up about Nehemiah's reforms. And I kind of put it like this. They liked the idea of the wall more when they still had their slaves. They liked the idea of a temple more when they still had their money. Sometimes I like the idea of Christianity more when it doesn't come with a cross. Sometimes I like the idea of being generous more when I still have my vacations and my video games. That's not all. Nehemiah 7 has this, we zoom out a little bit, and this list of exiles is really, uh, I mean, read through it. But in reality, it's a bit bittersweet because the number that he's accounting is actually a really small percentage of the Jewish community. The truth was, so many of the Jewish people had decided to stay in Babylon. You know, why would I go back to being part of a minority nation, abandoning the life I've built here in Babylon to start over again? Why would I go through all the work? Why go back to being limited to a narrower way of life? You might be thinking, why go through all the work of trying to repair my marriage? Why go through the humiliation of admitting that I was wrong? Why would I continue following Jesus when my friends who don't are getting better jobs, seem to live happier lives? Wouldn't I have more options for happiness and fulfillment if I didn't subject myself to outdated ethics and and be a little more open? I like the idea of following Jesus when it was easy. The challenge we're confronted with, though, 
is the real cost of that independence. It doesn't last. The younger son in the parable discovered this. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. And the truth is this, when the money runs out, someone has to pay. When, when the, the, the euphoric feelings of, of, of uh, romance burn out, someone's heart has to break. We eventually discover that we don't have enough on our own. We're chasing things and we also have limits. There's only so much money. There's only so much sex. There's only so much time. There's only so much uh, vacation. There's only so much, uh, there are only so much entertainment. We all have limits. Further, do we really want to live in a world where you turn your back on others for the sake of yourself? Is this the kind of life that we really want? We'd say no on the outset, but there are all these little temptations of having things our own way where that's exactly what we're doing. Is that how we want to be treated? Jesus uses this story of the, this parable to remind us that we can belong to a family. It's not always easy, but God has positioned himself as our perfect father. And while coming home isn't easy, right? It's where we find the freedom and love of belonging to a family. You don't have to perform in a family. You aren't valued in the kingdom of God based on what you've done or how you've done. You were called by someone, right? Before you're called to something. We're valued as sons and daughters. The awesome reality of the life of faith in the kingdom of God is that we live in the confidence of being co-heirs of the promised through Christ the Son. To follow Jesus is to be called children of God and it's time to come home. We see this cool progression in the, this parable of, of the younger son. He, he realizes that uh, he's eaten with pigs and he, he, he accepts this invitation to come home and he's rehearsing this to himself. He says, you know, I'm gonna set out, go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. This is the awesome reality of what we talked about earlier. When you're called by someone, not, uh, not called to do something, you're not called by what you do, you're called by who you are we don't have to interact with shame. And this is what the younger son had to deal with. They had to confront the like, ah, oh, I've abandoned my, my father. I rejected him. I'm gonna be humiliated going back. It's not easy. It takes maturity to admit that you were wrong, to, to save face and, and try to recover what you've lost. And we get this really cool picture within the Nehemiah story of, of Jesus. And it really floored me last week. Uh, we want to realize, like, think about it this way. How jacked would have Nehemiah have been? He's just realized that his own people are conspiring against him. Not only is it they're doing stuff wrong that need to be corrected, and not only are there outside forces, but there are actually his own people who are trying to, to ax him, to, to see him out of there so they can go back to the way that they used to be. What kind of maturity do you think you need to finish the job in that position? The place that he's preparing, he would have realized isn't full of the best and brightest, but maybe the discontented and, and needy, right? And this happens in this story. There's this conspiracy where they're trying to get him to flee into the temple. And of course, Nehemiah is not allowed in the temple. And they fake this plot against his life. And this is where he realizes, oh shoot, like my own people don't even want me here. It's kind of like trying to coach a sports team and half of your kids are lying on the grass and the other half have their fingers, you know, up their nose. Like, are you, are you trying to lose kids? Get up, start playing, get the ball. Why would I subject myself to this humiliation? I wonder if that's how Nehemiah felt. Why, why am I going through this? Not even, my own people don't even want me here. Jesus, I wonder if God feels this. Why do I put up with this? My own people turn away from me. Why does he do it? The reality is it's out of love. Nehemiah's response is the response of the father. You see, the father could have disinherited his younger son. The son had already disowned his family and taken the but 
He doesn't. Nehemiah discovers this plot. They're saying, run away, run away. Otherwise, they're going to kill you. What does Nehemiah say? This is so, so cool. How should a man such as I run away? Should a man such as I run away? Wow. I picture Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, faced with his own death. He's sweating blood. He's, he, he's wrestling the, the pros and cons of sacrificing himself for people who would turn on him so easily. In fact, they were asleep at the moment in his deepest hour of need. But Jesus ultimately says, not my will, Father, but yours be done. We get this picture in Nehemiah, this construction project. Here's the good news. Jesus is not afraid of you. He's not running away from you. In fact, he's running towards you. He's inviting you to come back home. The call of Jesus is to those who have nothing, to those who are broken, to those who don't have it all together. This is the heart of the father in in the midst of this. The father says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. This person who doesn't deserve it, who's coming back humiliated with nothing, having wasted his life. God says, the father says, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they begin to celebrate. The good news is that Jesus has built a place for you and me. Nehemiah finished the project and was preparing it for the return of the exiles. But this version of Jerusalem wasn't a perfect place. It wasn't ideal. It was full of discontents. It was full of imperfect people. Jesus would perfect this. He'd open up this city, not just for the lost of Jerusalem, but for all who are lost. The prophet Zechariah described Jerusalem, the city of God, as this immeasurable city without walls because of how many people were flocking to it. God revealed to the prophet in Zechariah 2 that that, uh, he himself would be the wall of fire around it and the glory within it. I'm reminded of Jesus encouraging his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I'm, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. The reality is this, God out of his great love for you and I has built a place for the lost to come home. He knows you aren't perfect and he isn't worried about that at all. We aren't called by God because of what we have or what we've done, we're called by God because of his love for you, his creation. And that love transforms us into a powerful community marked by his glory and his hope and his power. This is the life of the church. It's a family we belong to and become truly free and whole, where the lost are found and the dead are brought back to life. And then he reaches out to you and me and says, it's time to come home. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your gift of grace. We have been called by you out of your love for us. I pray that we would open our hearts to return to you. God, we know that we've gone astray. We know that sometimes this returning isn't easy. We have to admit that we were wrong. But in the face of that, we are subjected to this mercy that we don't deserve. That is such good news that we get to come home confident that you have made a place for us to be whole, a place for us to be safe, a place for us to grow and thrive. We pray that we would open ourselves to that, that that homecoming and find our belonging and being in you. Amen. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us. If you're looking to get connected, our Abbotsford campus has two services each Sunday, 9 a.m. and 1045. We would love to see you at one of our in-person gatherings. If you'd like to financially support us, you can always give at clcc.ca slash give. See you next time.